I normally don't pay attention to the sound of snow below my trucks or windshield wipers on my lift. But this morning I was especially sensitive to that because I'll be speaking with two individuals who these sounds would have been a lot more difficult for them to hear. I'm at the Google offices in Virginia. I'll be joining Vince Cerf, co-founder of the internet and chief evangelist at Google, along with Elise Roy, a deaf lawyer, artist, designer, and human rights advocate. And they both work in the vanguard of the social design movement. We'll be discussing how human-centered design is not for the slice of the pie, but for the greater good and for all. I'm Shay Fabade, and this is ETS Now. beautiful piece yeah. on the cello. That's the first re reaction, is that was beautiful. Yeah. The second one was to imagine what it would be like if you couldn't hear it. What a loss, yeah. literally. Yeah. Uh, and for many people, they will never hear that. Yeah. And so then the question is, is there anything you can do to help someone who can't hear appreciate what that's like? Yeah. And I think that's hard. Yeah. Um, it's uh, like being blind and trying to explain color to somebody who's blind. Uh, and so I kind of felt a feeling of regret that not everyone would be in a position to hear a beautiful piece like that. And then the last feeling was anger at myself because I didn't continue playing the cello and now I wish I had and I'm sort of thinking, well, maybe I can still get back to that, but I don't know. My 75-year-old hands may not remember enough. You probably could, though. So, well, people have been encouraging me to do that. And so I might, you know, if I ever retire, that might be one of the things I should try. <laughs> what did the piece make you feel? The, the cello piece, the music. Could you hear it? What did it make you feel? Um, yes, I could hear it, um, especially because it's very deep and rich. Yeah. And I really love uh, the sound of the cello. Um, it moved me, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and that, of course, that's, that is, of course, exactly what the performer is trying to do. He, it, with, the, with the help of that instrument, he's trying to deliver a message to you, uh, not through the cognitive parts of your brain, right. but through the emotional parts mm -hmm. of your brain. Mm -hmm. And he did. He, he succeeded. Did. He did. That's actually one reason why I haven't gotten a, a cochlear implant, because I love listening to music. And uh, sometimes that uh, changes the way that music sounds. So. And so um, I guess whoever wants to go first, uh, when did you discover your hearing impairment and how have you uh, benefited or um, how has it been a, an impairment on, on enjoying things like the cello. Yeah. When I discovered my hearing impairment yeah. and how often, what was the last part? And the benefits, any benefits you might have gained and how it's been a problem with um, uh, just <clears throat> people not designing solutions to help you enjoy the... Uh, when I was 10, my parents started noticing that something might be wrong and they took me to the audiologist and I went through the testing. And at the end, the audiologist sat me down and she said, you're not trying hard enough. Come back tomorrow. <laughs> <Schmack>. <laughs> 
So I came back the next day and I scored exactly the same. But they couldn't believe I had gotten so far uh, without, without being, anybody yeah, noticing. Um, so the benefit of my new year? Have, have there been any, any situations? You shared a story earlier about being a goalie and you, the fans, you could tune them out because you couldn't hear them. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely as a goalkeeper, I didn't hear all of that trash talk <laughs> going on behind. And so I could be very <laughs> focused. <laughs> um, it also, actually, uh, in some ways, it makes me speak very concisely and directly because when people speak to me they know they have like a limited time to get something across because they might have to repeat it and so I was brought up in that type of communication and so that's my communication style now mm. yeah it makes it easy for people like me to lip read although I'm not a lip reader mm -hmm. uh, you are easy uh, to understand precisely because of that so my wife would love that because she had to lip read for 50 years when she was uh, deaf after losing her hearing at age three. Uh, and that became her way of life. She was so good at it that when we moved to Washington 43 years ago, I thought she was working for the CIA but couldn't tell me about it. <laughs> and um, you also lost... Uh... I lost my hearing too, although my hearing uh, has been uh, declining over uh, the last 75 years. Mm -hmm. We didn't notice a hearing loss when I was born or anything like that. But I was six weeks premature. And this was 1943, and in those years, it wasn't clear what you did with a preemie. Mm -hmm. So they stuck me into a, uh, an oxygen uh, chamber, chamber in order to uh, help my then immature lungs uh, you know, gather oxygen and get it to the brain and everything else. The guess is that that six weeks prematurity may have caused the problem, or the oxygen may have caused the problem because uh, by the time I was about 13, it was pretty clear I was beginning to lose um, the ability to hear the, the teacher or the other students. So I would be sitting in the front of the class. I could hear the, um, the teacher, but if someone in the back of the room asked a question and the teacher said yes, I didn't know what to make of that because mm -hmm. I didn't know what the question was. <laughs> so I started wearing hearing aids when I'm 13, you know, behind the ear aids. Uh, and it helped a lot, but I have to tell you, when you're 13 years old, you're just kind of, you know, getting interested in girls and everything else, and you're the only guy in the school with a <laughs> pair of hearing aids. Uh, it's socially awkward, yeah. and especially if you're making out because they squeak. And you don't want to take them off because then you can't hear anything. But if you leave them on, they squeak, and that kind of breaks the mood. You know? so I'm sure it does. That was not the, you know, that was kind of an awkward period in my life. Um, but eventually, I got to the point where I'm very comfortable with the fact that I'm hearing impaired. My hearing gets worse every year by about one dB. Mm. So I'm instead of from being about 15 dB down, which is not much, when I was 13, now I'm more like 70 to 75 dB down uh, in both ears. Mm. But I'm very comfortable with the fact that I have that hearing loss, and I tell people, you know, openly that you know there are going to be situations where I need them to do something so I can hear them. Yeah. Or if I'm doing a speech, for example, uh, I usually say, put the microphones for questions close enough that I can lip read if I have to, mm -hmm. uh, or give me a headset so I can get the sound from the microphone directly into my ears, yeah. which is really smart because you hear better than everybody else in the auditorium <laughs> as a result. Yeah. So if I'm running a meeting, for example, and we're sitting around you know, a big table and there are 25 or 30 people, I usually put a headset on and plug into the uh, PA system that everybody else is, is listening to, but the sound is bouncing all over the building. I'm getting straight into my ears exactly what they said because the microphone Good is as far quality. away from yeah. them. Yeah. So I get better quality sound than everybody else. And so, you know, you just make up uh, you know, strategies for coping. For coping. Um, I, think, I believe I read somewhere that the internet was also, was also part of you figuring out a way to communicate because of that impairment. Can you share more? Sure. I mean, it, it, the uh, predecessor to the internet was called the ARPANET. Mm -hmm. This thing was sponsored by the Defense Department. They were trying to build 73? a system for command and control. Mm -hmm. So around 1969, we turned on this ARPANET thing. I'm at UCLA, I'm a graduate student. By 1971, one of the guys who was at Bolt Baroneck and Newman 
uh, his name is Ray Tomlinson, invents this idea of networked email, electronic mail. And the idea was simply that you could send a file from one computer to another, and the person who was receiving it could read it. And so we codified that. And so by 1971, early 72, email is our primary means of communication because it's precise. And oh, by the way, you don't have to be awake at the same time, yeah. you know, like you would have to be on a phone call. And uh, we had international collaborators in the uh, early 1970s who were in the UK and Europe and, and Asia. And so being awake at the same time was hard. Mm. So email became a tool for us to communicate. Of course, it was perfect for somebody like me <laughs> because I could read it easily even if I couldn't hear a telephone call. So this was a big deal. And I tended to end up in jobs that all had email availability. Mm. And I'm sure that either consciously or unconsciously, I chose positions to take where email was available. Remember, in 1970s, this was research stuff. Yeah. And it was just the research community that had access to it. By 1982, uh, I am building a commercial email system for a company called MCI, mm. called MCI Mail. And you know, what better arrangement for somebody like me. <laughs> I'm building an email system I can use and I can insist on everybody else using. Yeah. And so communication for me is easier. Yeah. And, and then it took me quite a long time to get my wife to agree to use email <laughs> because she was sort of anti-technology. You know, and said, don't show me that stuff. And I said, but we can communicate better. You know? <laughs> Eventually, it wasn't me. It was her friends uh, who uh, were part of her book club that finally got her to use email because mm. that was easier than trying to call her on the phone. <laughs> so, so it has been a theme yeah. in my career, yeah. literally, you know, since the uh, late 1960s. That's fascinating. And Elise, you shared earlier when we were talking that on phone calls for you, you have an app that transcribes. Um, you've also sort of found a way to ensure you can engage. What design for usability would you like to see, similar to what he I would love to see some sort of technology innovation where um, when we communicate with each other, it creates images as well, what we're trying to convey. Wow, that's interesting. And I wonder <laughs> if it will improve communication for everyone. Where this company I'm working with right now, actually, I'm trying to figure out how to improve their communication. They communicate too complex. Mm -hmm. um, and they use different speak from their customers. And so there's misunderstanding. Yeah. Can we create um, mm -hmm. something that's visible? That simplifies the engagement. That's, that's really hard. To do that automatically is very hard. <laughs> Uh, we do have things going on here at Google uh, that involve transcription of, t of speech. Um, and that's because a lot of uh, interaction uh, with our products and services is voice-based in both directions. Mm -hmm. And so in order to correctly process this stuff, we have to take the sound and turn it into text. The mm -hmm. computer then does, you know, like if you ask a question of Google Assistant, it's actually reading the text, yeah. not listening to the sound. The other thing we've done is to do language translation. And we've got to the point now where we can do language translation in real time. So, like, for example, if I go to you, I don't know how to speak Polish. Do you speak French? Do you speak Deutsch? So these are all non-English languages. And it would be nice if you could either hear or see the translation of those languages into English, which is what we're using now. So we have technology that will do that. And the assistant in the headphones, yeah? Well, yes, we have, we have earphones that you can wear, and they have microphones in them. So yeah. you can say something, and the assistant will respond. And I mean, because you're, you're talking about translation, and I oh. believe you're well, let's, let's split this into three pieces, okay? okay? Yes. First of all, you have to do speech recognition. You have to be able to, literally, the computer has to be able to hear the sound and figure out what the words are. Then you hand those words to the computer that tries to figure out what the words mean. So if you said to uh, the Google Assistant, okay, Google, what's the weather today? 
it has to translate that in, not into another language, mm -hmm. but into text. Mm -hmm. So that's speech recognition. Then there's speech understanding. That was a question. How do I answer the question? And then it has to generate speech to respond to you audibly yeah. by saying, for example, it's going to snow today, yeah. which it did. So, uh, so that's all speech understanding, speech recognition, uh, interaction, text to speech and speech to text. Then comes language translation, where you take Spanish and translate it into English or French or German or Russian or something. That's yet another layer of computer processing. And it's very helpful if you have two people talking to each other who don't share a common language. Yeah. And your point about not natural languages, but specialized languages is equally important. Mm -hmm. So if you have a kind of corporate internal uh, language, language yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that you use in order to make the conversations briefer, that may not be understandable to the general public. Yeah. And so you have to figure out how to translate that. Now, your point, though, the one which I find most challenging is the idea of being able to take what people are saying and to produce some kind of imagery which amplifies and helps uh, convey the meaning. Mm -hmm. I think that's really hard. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, my favorite mode of interacting with someone on some complicated topic is to stand in front of a whiteboard drawing pictures Visual. of what we're talking about yeah. so that the person I'm talking to and I have the same mental model yeah. of, the, of what the discussion is about. Yeah. And once we've settled on that, then we have the ability to uh, analyze and, and develop. Yeah. So, um, Elise, you, you've shared one example of what you'd like to see. Mm -hmm. um, any other design for inclusion, for usability ideas, your... I love email. <laughs> That's a great one. Um, if you look at our phones, uh, the screen, uh, that was designed for people with visual difficulty. Uh, Siri was designed um, for people with cognitive... No. Dexterity. With co well, with, Dexterity. Cognitive, with cognitive impairments, yeah. Um, so the telephone, email, all of these things that are on an instrument that we use daily yeah. were designed originally for disability. Yeah. And that's powerful. Yeah. <laughs> and what I'd like to see is right now, people look at designing for disability as doing good. Mm. But really, it's this powerful tool that we have to create groundbreaking innovation. Mm. And I'd love to see a switch um, in people's mindsets and be able to really do it in that sense. So uh, I want to react to that because Please. I agree with that motivation. <laughs> Here's the problem. The people who design applications for computer-based systems often are not impaired in any way. Yeah. And so they don't even have a visceral sense uh, for what you would need to do to make that application work for someone with a particular kind of disability. Moreover, the disabilities occupy a huge spectrum. It's not like blind is this narrow thing. It's visual impairment varies all over the place. Hearing impairment varies all over the place. Motor impairment varies. And so when you're thinking about accessible and inclusive design, you actually have to think about this broad spectrum of responses in order to make things usable. The bad thing is that a lot of these folks design and build their systems for people with what we'll call normal capability, and then they imagine you can sprinkle pixie dust on it in order to make it accessible, like throw it at a JAWS screen reader. <laughs> and the answer is no, it doesn't work that well. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, what you have to do, and what you obviously are trying to do, is to get the designers to start from the beginning saying, okay, here's an application. Yeah. What do I need to do to deal with this very range spectrum of, of challenges, challenges, this spectrum? Yeah. And you have to be really thoughtful about the design. Yeah. The point that you made, which resonates with me so strongly, is we have this powerful thing called a computer. It's the most adaptable piece of equipment on Earth. And yet we have failed 
to make it work for us to make things usable and accessible. Yeah. You know, what's the matter with us? <laughs> you know, it's just staring us in the face. Yes, we, we seem to be the problem. I guess um, last thoughts on designing for those extremes and this full spectrum. Um, uh, an example I always go to is uh, the curb cuts on, on roads. Mm -hmm. um, right. That has become valuable to everyone. To everybody even though it was designed for, for um, accessibility wheelchairs, primarily, for wheelchairs. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on, on the, the leading products that are doing that right now, if you have Leave any ideas, yeah. on, on new ideas, um, and, I, and you've shared the, the text to visual, do you see any products out there that are designed for the extreme that will impact the, gen, the general populace? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm in. So, so yeah, no, let's, let's talk <laughs> about Please, this. Yeah. He, he, so, uh, remember the curb cuts were helpful for people in wheelchairs, but they also helped everybody else with a, with a cart, for example, or a, a baby carriage. So what, what we're trying to ask now is, what other kinds of technical things can we do that will not only benefit some people with extreme uh, accessibility problems, but might also benefit the general public. Technical things like in how we design. Uh, well, yeah. How do well? What what designs do you think we need to do in order to um, attack these really tough, extreme problems of uh, usability? So, are there any examples? You talked about taking sound and turning it into pictures. Is there anything else on the horizon that you think we should be pursuing? I mean. I think the biggest thing is changing how you, you mentioned, um, how we often create something and uh, then we make it accessible. Um, I think it's approaching it like uh, we want to give someone this overall experience. How can we do that in multiple ways? Um, okay, so this is actually a good clue. It's a really good clue. That's why starting out not with, this is the thing I want to offer, how do I make it accessible? I think, let's turn this around and say, okay, given this person's capabilities, how would I design things to adapt to that particular person's need? Yeah. And so now we have to ask ourselves, what, is, what design principles do we apply in order to particularize these things for individuals? Yeah. And you know, do we have knobs that they can turn uh, do, you know, do we build a special version for, you know, you can't build a special version for everybody. That's, no. that's hard. <laughs> but you could build something which is more adaptable yes. and configurable yes. and let people interact with it and then respond and say, I can't hear this very well. And, and let them do something simple like slide something back and forth in the frequency range. So let them help us adapt yeah, some of these interfaces. Product by making it a bit more broad in its application right. and let them right. customize and it to their And let needs. them yeah. experiment with, yeah. you have to give them easy ways to do that. Yeah. And so I think we don't think about that as much as we should. No, definitely not. Definitely not. And the problem is that we need to build adaptation into everything because technology is changing us at Rapidly. You know, this amazing pace. Yeah. And if we don't build it in, then we're going to be behind. Yeah. Um, so and so that's... Sorry. Yeah. Well, no, there's another. There's another really good example uh, that I try to remind people about. Now, often in this conversation, we talk about people with some permanent disability. Mm. Every single person on the planet, at one time or another in their lives, is going to experience a disability, yeah. even if it's only temporary. Like yeah. you broke your arm, you burned your hand. You can only use one hand at a time, or you broke your leg and you're in a wheelchair for six weeks. Like I was. I want to remind months. everybody yeah. why it's important to build these adaptable. Yeah. usable, yeah. accessible things, because one day or another you're <laughs> going to be thankful that somebody <laughs> like you did that. Thought about it, yes. But it's not just that. It's that as we go about our way in the world, we're putting different contexts and environments. And when we go in those environments, we often experience these momentary or situational disabilities. Mm. When you drive, we're currently blind to anything but the road. Mm. So audiobooks, which was created for the blind, um, is valuable. Mm. 
Uh, although it's also potentially distracting, and so we want to be a little thoughtful about that when you're driving. <laughs> you don't want to be too distracted. You certainly don't want the plugs in your ear, for example, because you might not hear the siren that's behind that you. Is true. So we need, we actually need, uh, if it's not a self-driving car, we still need a car which has sensors in it that cover more territory than our sensors do. Mm. And that's true for everyone whether you have a disability or, or not. not. Yeah. The car needs to be aware of other cars around it. It needs to signal you, don't turn into the right lane yet yeah. because there's a car there <laughs> or there's a car coming. Yeah. And so we need the technology to expand our own sensing system, yeah. regardless of whether we have an impairment or not, yeah. because it makes us safer. Yeah. 